Uh, my name is Iman Seyime. Uh, I'm a professor in the art department, and uh, this is... Uh, my name is Rob Thorne. I am a adjunct professor in the history department. Oh, you can't hear you, Robert. I'm sorry, what was that? can't hear you. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, for those in the back, Rob Thornton. I work for the history department as adjunct and as an academic advisor for the urban education program. And uh, this is a, this is a, a one third of a series of conversations that we are having today uh, that are in conjunction, that are occurring in conjunction with an exhibition that I currently have in the art gallery titled Ten Little Nigger Girls." You've probably seen the flyers around and cringed. Um, well. I was hoping to bring some kind of context to the exhibit, uh, which uh, is powerful in its own way. Uh, and so that is what this is. It's really a conversation between myself and Robert. So you are a bit like voyeurs, like you're, you're looking at something maybe you shouldn't be seeing, you know? Um, but in a way, the, the point of this is to help unpack some of, uh, some of the material in the exhibit when you see it. Uh, and to help me understand things, maybe from a perspective that I, I haven't understood it in the past, or even while I was working on the images. So before we get started with the Piccadilly at play, I do want to honor the space. This is the Black Box Theater. Who has never been in the Black Box Theater before? Okay, that's a lot of people. Welcome to the Black Box Theater. And it would be very, uh, um, it would be unscholarly of me, all right, to uh, have you come here, many of you for the first time, without knowing uh, maybe one of the upcoming events in the black box. And so uh, the Student Theater Association is going to be putting on uh, a production called Praying for Rain. Praying for Rain. That is why this, this, this setup looks like this. So uh, this is all student setup. Like they didn't bring an outsider to come and do this. So it's really quite remarkable what your fellow students are doing here at Westfield. So that is going to be February 18th through the 20th. Uh, at 8 o'clock p.m. and also on February 20th at 2.30 p.m. So I have the information, you can hit me up afterwards if you need, if you want to write this down, and come back here, see what some of your fellow students are working on. So, so now we start the Piccadilly at play, uh, puzzles, postcards, and the black body as pictorial commodity. And uh, the first thing I want to do is give you a very, very, very brief introduction to what I've been working on over the last year. And so this project in the gallery titled 10 Little Nigger Girls um, is based off of a book that was published in 1907 by a British author, her name is Nora Case. And the book is a children's book uh, titled 10 Little Nigger Girls. She also had one called 10 Little Nigger Boys. She didn't want to discriminate against one. Yep. So 10 Little Nigger Girls and Boys is an interesting book series, children's books um, that are that, 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 that feature these little girls that are, that are killed off or eliminated. They're not all killed <coughs> off, but they're eliminated from this story in these, some of these horrific ways, some of them are. Um, and some of them are not as horrific. So in this one here, okay, well that's kind of horrific. So um, she's paddling in the sun, and a big fish come, feels hungry, and then, then, then there's, you know. And then the, the one that always got me was um, seven little girls making toffee sticks, one gets burnt up. So they're making candy, and, and this one dies, and ha ha ha, isn't it funny? Now they're only six. So it's in this vein uh, that, that, my, that my inquiry into this time period begins with this book. And what I discovered, it, 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 well, and this is one of the pieces that I created uh, that's based off of the, um, the book. What I, as I was doing my research on the book, I, I found out that there are these interesting ties between the book and music history, that is um, the minstrelsy and so-called coon songs, uh, uh, specifically one that was written in 1868 titled Ten Little Engines. You've probably heard the chorus for that one, little two, little three, little Indians, for the, they, it's now Indians. Um, and they don't sing the whole song because the whole song is horrific, one breaks his neck and all kinds of things. So there's this interesting connection between literature and music and visual art that I'm trying to unpack in my images. And I have contemporary girls that are kind of entangled in this really, really sorted history. Um, uh, and I'm talking about present day dangers. Here is a girl entitled Suicide Girl um, who sees herself both as um, the monster and 
the heroine, Perseus, until the only heroic thing she can do is to cut her head off because that's what you would do if you were Perseus and you saw Medusa. But she sees herself as a monster, so she kills herself. So there are a series of girls that I created that talk about real life dangers that little girls go through. But wrapped up in all of this, these images here um, and my images is really a type of, char of, of character that shows up um, in historical images of black people by whites. And one of these caricatures is known as the Piccaninny. Um, they're these little black children who, who are, they eat a lot of watermelon because that's what they do, all right? And, they're, they're, and sometimes they're shown as quite adorable. Like, that, I mean, that is a, you have to admit that is adorable. All right. Um, even though it's kind of making fun and poking fun at black children, watermelon, they're used for advertisements. And, and then there are these moments where the Piccaninny, these little black unkept children, um, unkempt children, um, who find themselves into trouble and they're bothersome and they're, they're, they're unlearned and they don't really speak good English and all this other stuff. They find themselves in these moments of danger. Um, in objects that are collected, like this ash, like, like this ashtray here, or this pen holder. Oh, isn't that interesting? It's an alligator. And look, you put the pen inside the holder, and the, the pen is the little. So you get it, right? It's the big joke. Um, and so these become things that are collected, that are purchased. And, and then you have advertisements such as this one, I'm not going to go into great detail, where the piccaninny, the little black child, is used as either, in this case, a dainty morsel, something you would want to eat, or in this case, you know, something that the alligator will get rid of, right? The alligator, um, the whole notion of alligator bait or gator bait, you hear that a lot in Florida um, with sports. Ah, you're gator bait. There's a history of that, um, and it's a racial history um, of black children imagined as gator bait, and legend is that you have instances of black children who may have been used to lure alligators out of you know, ponds and so on and so forth. It's legend. There is no written, real written history of it. But the suggestion is enough that you could ever imagine um, a black kid in a situation like this, right? So, and, and so on and so forth. So now we, I'm going to turn this over to Rob, um, who can offer a, a type of history historical analysis to this that perhaps I cannot, and then we're gonna talk about a few other things. Sure, I just want you to take a brief second to, to read the text on this particular slide. Because this is really the gateway to what we're gonna, we're really gonna change gears here. We're really gonna talk about how we have this innocent caricature purchased, you can use it as an ashtray, you can use it as a pin holder, and we're gonna really see a violent turn with some of these commodities. And before I, I get into the postcards that we'll eventually talk about, um, in, in the same innocence, in the same playful manner, we see board games, puzzles, in addition to ashtrays and, and pin holders that we, we just showed you. Uh, I really want you to see right here, that's, anyone familiar with Parker Brothers? Yeah, it, definitely. <laughs> Salem, Massachusetts, okay. So we're not just talking about Florida. We're not just talking about uh, old Dixie here. We're also talking about uh, north of the Mason-Dixon line where racism is not relevant, right? False. <laughs> I, I don't want you to think that because of the benevolent Northern Army that racism did not exist past uh, Pennsylvania. Uh, Parker Brothers created a game called The, the Game of Ten Little Niggers. And we also see uh, target games, uh, specifically going into the 20th century. So that, those puzzle games were 19th century, the 1800s, specifically the late 1800s. We start to see a development of a more violent game as we go into the 20th century, especially when we see games that actually have guns. You, you shoot at these targets. Originally, we had four. Oh, now you can purchase the new edition of Four Little Nigger Boys. You get five little nigger boys. And guess what it comes with? The watermelon coon. Oh, oh. well that's useful. Yeah. <laughs> Again, what we're starting to see here is these are for purchase. These are for purchase. This is, this is for fun. This is for entertainment. You gather around a table 
and, and you play these games, or if you're children, you gather around and you, you figure out you figure out the pickaninnies. Where are they? Uh, arrange them, arrange the flaps by placing one over the other in such a manner as to show all eleven pickaninnies. I looked up the um, the almond manufacturing company uh, just out of curiosity. It's like, oh wow, Amazon! Like, you, like, the, like there's still stuff floating around, you know, with the almond manufacturing company and Parker Brothers. Well, I couldn't have gotten through the '80s without Parker Brothers, sure. you know. So sure. it's like, sorry, you shouldn't have done that. I, I, was, I was raised in the '80s, okay? But that's just an interesting fact that these are these are still <coughs> these are names. These are companies that still persist. It's not um. You know, we're not dealing with something from the 1600s. It's, 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 it's relatively recent history. Um, and so the idea that if there's a market and somebody will buy it, we made it, and that's why we're still here, Parker Brothers, Absolutely. that's just kind of interesting. Absolutely. Okay. So let's go a little deeper. Um, if you are familiar with lynchings and the violent history that the United States experienced during this time, uh, right after Reconstruction, Right into the development of the Jim Crow South, uh, we're talking about separate but equal. Okay, that's law. Plessy v. Ferguson, 1896. Okay, uh, we have swift justice associated with the Jim Crow South, and what we see here is a postcard. Everyone familiar with a postcard? Um, perhaps. We're, we're a little more familiar with it because if we've ever traveled to a city or if we've ever gone abroad, we might have sent home a postcard of where we've gone. Barcelona. Mm -hmm. Ooh. But this is where I was. This is where I was. Yeah. You know, it, it's a celebration. It's, hey, look where I've been, right? Um, I'm giving you an update. Or I wish you were here. I wish you were here. I wish you were here, right? Um, so this image, and if you can see the arrow pointing, that is an African American hung, and we see, I, I, I can't estimate here, maybe 100, maybe more than 100 people in attendance here. Um, and, and they're all well dressed, I, for the most part, right? So, so what's going on here? And, and you can see what the, what the postcard reads. Well, John, this is a token of a great day we had in Dallas. A Negro was hung for an assault on a three-year-old girl, and I saw this on my, on my noon hour. I was very much very much in the brunch. When we, when we read the context of this postcard, when we see this image, this is celebratory. Uh, this is an event. This is, let me step out during my lunch hour and see them hang this nigger. This is something that's captured on a postcard and then mass produced reproduced and then sent to people to either remember I was there and we, we saw this event or hey I wish you were here. That is a human body that you see hung with chain. Uh, that is Jesse Washington, uh, one of the most infamous lynchings in American history uh, because of the brutality uh, the, the, the act on this human body was so brutal that it's unrecognizable. You don't even, what, what is that? Yeah. And again, this is on postcards. And this one particularly reads, this is the barbecue we had last night. My picture is to the left with a cross over it. Your son, Joe. But, but, okay, so Robert, I, so, because I, I've tried to make sense of, I've tried to make sense of these objects that exist, that, so they're here. Oh, let me ask a question first. And I actually want just an honest raise, raise of hands. Raise of hands, is that right? We'll go. All right. Um, how many of you all um, learned of this history in your history classes in high school? It's actually a decent number. I had never learned of this at all. So the, the, the ways in which I, I, I learned about um, this very strange, uh, this very strange 
set of histories, recent histories um, in America uh, was through my own kind of like stumbling upon. If you're, if you're around enough black scholars or black people who are into scholarship, you know, you'll, somebody will say, hey, that's when you, I mean, I knew what being lynched meant, right? But I'd never been in a class where we had actually gone through it. Like, uh, like we've gone through, um, we had gone through the, the Jewish Holocaust. Like we, I understood that. We watched Schindler's List. Like we had a conversation, and I was disturbed and distraught. And we, we talked about Gandhi, and we talked about, you know, kind of like the, the staples of world history, you know, and the atrocity, the notion of what the atrocity is, and, and learning about apartheid, and we, we learned about that. But somehow, in my classes, this was glossed, really, really glossed over. And it didn't seem like it was an like out of malice type thing. It was just not discussed. And as I got older, it was when I got to college in my sophomore year that I actually had my first, I mean, it was kind of unsettling, my first shove into this history through one class that I took, which happened to be a class on ethnography, the sociology of like, you know, black and brown people essentially. Well, not just that, but you know. So I, and, and I was, this was thrust in my, in, my, in my atmosphere, and I didn't know what to do with it. And so I have to ask you, you know, Robert, you're a historian, you're a writer, you consider these things, you've been considering these things for years, possibly longer than I have, even though I'm older than you. What do you make of this? And I mean on an emotional level for you, because, because on, on my end, I'm trying to understand I'm not, it's not just that, it's not just that the body here, it's not just that, it's not just that somebody's dead and hanging from a pole, right? It's that there's this willingness to be shown as one of the people who did this, right? It's like we have a selfie culture now, right? And so the idea that at this time, it's like, you know, I want to be in the picture too, right? I want to be here with this body. I want people to know that I did this. And then, that this isn't just a photograph, that this photograph goes through a series of transformations. It goes from, from film and this instrument, so a, a photographer's present, right? It's not just a lynch mob. There are people taking pictures, right? Not with phones. You are, you know, not everybody was a photographer back then. Real cameras. And then, it goes through its process of development, and then it's turned, it's made into postcards because of popular demand. And then the mailman is seeing this and dropping it in mailboxes. I, I don't know what to do with that. So there's a rage there, but there's also like an intrigue, like does this still exist? Is this still here? And I'm just wondering on an emotional level, I'm gonna be out of other slides, but on an emotional level, what, where are you with this and have you, found a way to reconcile this with what you do and who you are. I, I think as a larger body of being part of the larger body of history, first I need to acknowledge that this is a history that is ignored in large institutions in this country, particularly in the South, um, are well aware of this history and have put <coughs> this in archives and it's accessible to anyone that wants to, to access this sort of information. I, I think in the last 20 years, we, we see an emergence of historians start to locate these commodities, these, these items that can be purchased that have an extremely racist history. Um, for me, <laughs> this, this is, I'm sick. And similar to your discovery of these histories, my exposure to lynching was college, uh, junior year, taking an African-American diaspora class that didn't have to go this deep into, into the subject. I mean, we really focused more on the removal of, of Africans from the continent, largest continent on earth, and, and, and brought to a place uh, where they're subjected to forced labor. But we, we, we went further into the analysis and really got to a place where we we see that violence manifested in its reoccurring, whether that was through um, the the Civil War, whether that was through 
reconstruction and we got to this point and I had no idea that this even existed, postcards, postcards. I, I had no idea this existed to that point. And then I did my own, and this is, I'm dating myself, not too far, but this is 2006, 2007. And then for the first time, there's a documentary that actually covers this particular subject and how it, it was masked. Uh, it, it's sickening because as, as a historian, your goal is to uncover the truth, to, to, to provide the truth to, to the people, and, and then you can make a decision whether or not we want to make these same mistakes again as, as a society, as, as beings. This is sickening. And to see the violence, because you hear it, you, you know that lynching was going on, and it wasn't just African Americans, but primarily African Americans. Um, you, you hear about the violence of the Ku Klux Klan, the second Ku Klux Klan that emerges at the turn of the 20th century, and you hear about the violence. We'll talk about Emmett Till in a second, but this, this puts it into perspective how much this country was involved in violence in, in, in how polarizing this, this is. So it, it's tough. It's a tough history to digest, but um, you have to present this to people. You have to show this. Yeah. You have to show this. this. This is evidence. This is just like going to the Holocaust Museum in DC and seeing the thousands of shoes in front of you to, 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 sh to give you an idea of how the magnitude of violence or the magnitude of hate that existed. Yeah. So that's what this is for me. This, this is me walking through that Holocaust Museum. This is, as much as this hurts as a person that is distraught because not of the body, but the violence and what that meant, how we got to this point. That, that in addition to the lack of knowledge about it, that, that's what really hurts. Yeah. I think I'm interested in the idea that, that, these, that, these, um, that the atrocity, that the atrocity of the documentation of the atrocity, oh, yeah, yeah, there's more. Um, the, atro the, the, document the documentation of the atrocity becomes marketable, uh, or becomes not just purchasable, right. but actually the, the commodification Right, these things become commodities. This is in your drugstore. Right. Th this is this is like going to Walmart, and you're at the counter with all the magazines, and, and, and this is right next to it. This is this is what you're seeing. This is this is for purchase. And when I when I when I speak to and I haven't gotten to uh, in African American, I teach African American art. So my my class. Where's my class? Oh, yeah, they're here. All right. So <laughs> I love my students. Um, we haven't gotten to this preview, but it's coming. So, but when I teach this in my class, we, um, I, I, one of the things I take note of is, uh, I'm interested not in just, okay, yeah, so there's a body that's burning there, and, um, and he was, he, and yes, he was burned, he was burned alive. Uh, often when we think of lynching, we think of, um, when we think of lynching, we think of uh, uh, a noose. We think of a noose, and we think of a tree, and, and actually, uh, as I've done more and more research, another kind of harsh portion of the history that has been glossed over is that I think most lynchings were actually burnings, yeah. were public burnings. That I didn't know. Yes. I didn't realize that uh, so many of them were actually uh, uh, public burning, burnings that included vivisections, um, that would be cutting you open while you're alive, um, and castrations, and you know, um, you don't need those eyes anymore, or uh, or just uh, and, and and what would what would happen is because you can easily beg the question, Professor Emet, he did assault a three-year-old girl, right? So I mean, come on, you know, what would you want to do if that was your daughter? Uh, and the, the the problem the problem with the problem with the activity itself is that. A lot of the a, a lot of a lot of the people who were originally accused for these acts were later exonerated. It, it was too late after they were dead. So, uh, of the many people that were lynched, uh, many of them many of them who who were killed in the most horrific ways uh, were these were symbolic lynchings. They found one person. If you're dealing if you're in a if you're in a community of relatively poor white people. 
in the South. And there is a burgeoning, increasing uh, number of African Americans who are maybe competing over the same, if they're farmers as well, right? And, um, and now there's a, there's a reason for, and I'm putting this in quotes, of white anger in that area. Um, what ends up happening is you are now in danger if you're an African American and you happen to be doing well in any capacity. Um, and then you become, you become the target, you become like the, the representation of everything that a poor white person is afraid of, of, of working class or poor. Um, everything that they fear, everything they're angry about, you become that target. Because what I'm trying to understand is how you, how you get to a place where that many people will dress up to burn someone alive. Because that would be the question, right? I mean, we have to be interested in this beyond the car wreck that this is, right? We have to be interested in it like, what, how do we arrive at this place? We would never do that again, come on. That was the early 1900s. But how do we arrive at a place where a group of people are so terrified slash angry slash worried um, that one person becomes <coughs> becomes the, the moment of all of their aggression in that one moment, but then it's relived, it's relived, it's captured and then purchased and, and, and duplicated and spread apart. And, 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 uh, and, and so for me, that, that's, always, um, that's always been the interest, is the purchasability of this right. um, has been the interest of this for me. Um, the, the atrocity becoming purchased um, has always been um, the interest for me, especially when I'm looking at, um, at this. And I, I think a, another key aspect, too, is, is looking at, all right, so we're trying to figure out why is this happening? Why, why do we have a production of this event of lynchings? I mean, as you mentioned earlier, I mean, these, to set up the, the photographs, the photography, that's a project uh, to, to get the right angle or, or, or to get the image captured and then going through that process of, of producing the film. And now we have our photograph and now, now we're gonna put this on a postcard and, and we're gonna see this you know, purchased throughout wherever stores, wherever the case may be. <coughs> what motivates that? What motivates that, that market? Because there has to be a market for, for a product to be created, and and why is that product uh, in such demand? I, I think those are the the biggest questions that comes out of this type of history. Is why do we have these products, and, and why are they why are they why are they purchased? I have a question for you. The, along those along those lines, and um, I I only thought to ask you this question right now. Because you are bridging, to some degree, you start off with this conversation about, about uh, purchasable items, puzzles, right? With puzzles, we have games, we have little, little toy guns. Pow, pow, kill the black person, right? All right, so I don't know if those are the sounds that were made, but you get it, right? So we have those things, and, and, then, and then we kind of make this leap to the, the lynching, the photograph, the photograph of the, these things here. Yeah. Are you, do you think, it, is it the same person that's buying these? Is it, it, is it necessarily the same person that's buying these? Are these two different markets? And you may not know the answer to this, I'm just sure. throwing it out there but, but, as, a, as a question. I, I think one part is yes, I think the same people are purchasing these, these items. Think about anything that you collect, right? Uh, if, if you collect uh, base, baseball cards, and, and, and as a kid, you. You know, you always enjoyed that process of getting the baseball card and maybe getting that all-star, right? Uh, I got Hank Aaron's card, right? And, and you put that away, and you might have traded your other cards away. And, and then as you get older, maybe that continued. You start buying more sports memorabilia. Perhaps it's in that vein where, yes, for some reason, in, in some sick individual's mind, they want to own this, this type of product. But it's, again, it's, it's, it was really hard to discover these, these commodities because these things were tucked away for the most part. 
After a certain time. After a certain time, yes. So, so there is a sh maybe there is a shame attached to, to this. Maybe not. Maybe this was like, I think we were talking about this the other day. It's like uh, you go into your dad's room and you find his Playboys. Right? And, you know, that's, that's. Oh, that's I wasn't agreeing like, you know, like this is my story. <laughs> I, was just, I would say go on. All right. Yeah. Keep going. So, right. so, so, you know, you find something that you're not really supposed to see. Right? Uh, and now you have that vision. And, so you want to further explore, well, what else is here? Mm -hmm. What else is in this magazine, right? I think there's an element of that attached to it. There is a, well, you know what? This is such a, a, a tragic event, and maybe there's a, a negative feeling attached to that. Well, he deserved it, right? Uh, but I really, this is not for the, the family viewing. This is not to be out in, in a, in a photo book or an album or something like that. Or maybe it was. Maybe this was something. I mean, it, there has to be some sort of owning it because if you're not collecting the postcard, you're sending it. Right. So, you know, some sort of address is on there. And most people aren't buying postcards to collect them. No. You do have the occasional nerd. Yeah, I'm a nerd, don't worry. So. You do have the occasional nerd that, that you collect little things that nobody else does. You know, I, I, I collected seashells. I, I don't go into it, but I, I used to collect them, okay, when I was a kid. But you collect things like, oh, wow, that's a really cool one, sure. you know? So the idea that, but, but postcards aren't meant to, be, to stay in one place. No. You know, so the, the, these set of images actually uh, are intriguing to me uh, because these aren't postcards. So these are cabinet cards, uh, I guess four, private display like if you were gonna ha you would have these at home somewhere I, I wouldn't say in a frame but maybe in a special album and we don't know who this guy is the guy who you see posed here we don't know who he is a lot of lynchings went uh, unrecorded a lot of uh, there are a lot of undocumented of, of um, lynchings and this one here is of particular interest to me because of the role of the photographer in this one. You know, in the other images, in the other ones we've seen, there is this, uh, you don't think, oh, there's a photographer here. Like over here, I mean, we know there's a photographer, but you're not, you're, you are taken by what you're seeing here. You know, the people here, we know the photographer, the people are posing, right? But this is a very impactful image by itself. Here though, is the reminder, this series, this narration, right? Uh, this narrative of what's going on. Is, the photographer is complicit in this, right? Do it, you know, pose him this way. Let me make sure the lighting is correct. And, and, um, and some of the things that go on, some of the descriptions of this, uh, what we can't see here are uh, certain people, I believe it's this guy, you know, he actually has blood stains on him. So this guy's blood is all over the place. It, he has been tortured, they're beating him, uh, and, uh, but yet the guy remains defiant. Like, look, look at his face. And I think that all of that is part of, is part of this story. It's like, look at this, look at this, this buck, whatever you want to call him. Right, um, but he ends up he ends up like this, and these reminded me. Uh, I don't know how many. I don't know if you all have, if you come to my class, you'll definitely learn this. But I don't know if you've ever um, heard of the slave daguerreotypes of uh, of, uh, the, of the of the eighteen fifties. There was a scientist by the name of Louis Agassiz out of Harvard, um, a Swiss American scientist who um, who uh, who went to South Carolina and took pictures for research purposes uh, of the races. He took pictures of slaves in South Carolina, a family of slaves. And, and the pictures are very haunting, they're very sad. It's just a black man, uh, uh, several black men and one, and one black woman um, just looking at the camera head on and also profile view. Two pictures for each. And the black woman is topless. She's, her, you know, her breath, it's, a, it's science, right? And, um, and the karyotypes, you know, they, they're not like our cameras now. Um, it's not a snapshot. You're sitting there waiting for this thing to develop. You know, uh, sometimes depending on who, wh which researcher you talk to, you're talking anywhere between three minutes of sitting to much longer, an hour of sitting still, so that this you're you're captured properly. 
But there's this whole idea of the pose, of, of but having this object pointing at you and being subjected to a double kind of, of humiliation. It's not enough that you can't do anything because you're a slave, you know, if you're these slaves, but you have this thing, you don't even know what it is. It's capturing a portion of you. And this reminds me of, of, of those pictures, of those daguerreotypes, this idea of the guy, he's posed, um, and it feels so, somewhat scientific. I've seen pictures like this in anthropology books of Africans. Notice the buttocks of the Negro is higher than blah, 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 blah. Like I've seen this in anthropology books. And, it, and, it, and eugenicists right. going into the 20th century. Right, right. Like this is why, this is why the Negro is this. This is why, um, this is why, you know, they smell funny and look, look at their breasts, you can tell, right? There's something about this that reads that way, but then back to the whole issue of, of the, the pornographic image. Mm -hmm. um, there is something porn-oriented um, with, with this one in particular, the idea that these weren't mass produced, um, that the, the, the violence that's captured here, even the way he's posed at the end, the, look at how he's, they, they tie this thing around his waist. And it, there, it's something very artistic about the whole thing. <coughs> his arms are bound, you know, um, still, this time now behind him, once they, once they lynch him. But there's something about this that is very, um, there's something about this that is somewhat pornographic. The idea that this is a way in your inner sanctum you know, and only, it's for your eyes and only who you invite, you know, to see this. Uh, and then replaying, repl the replaying of this kind of violence that was enacted on this man. It's a very, very odd thing. Not enough writing has been done um, on, on this. Some writing has been done on, on, on these kinds of, of objects, but certainly um, not enough. I know you wanted to uh, have a conversation about Emmett Till. Sure, sure. And, 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 then, and then we'll open up to yep. a little bit of conversation if we have time. Sure. So I, I wanted to wrap this up by, by displaying Emmett Till. Um, if you're familiar with the story, um, 1955, young 14 year old from Chicago goes down to visit some family um, in Mississippi. Um, supposedly, allegedly, uh, he catcalled a, a white woman and the husband, the brothers, anyone else associated with, with, with the woman uh, killed Emmett Till. And, Again, similar to how we see these lynchings, very violent death. Um, and the point I wanted to make here with Emmett Till is this is one of the very few times in American history that we see a black body, dead black body portrayed not to celebrate, not as a commodity, um, not celebrated. It, it, it's, it's to make a point. It's to highlight the violence of Jim Crow. And the mother made an open decision. This, this was something that Emmett Till's mother decided to do. She wanted an open casket uh, funeral. She wanted the world to see what Jim Crow, what racism did to her boy. And this is 1955. Um, I, I like to argue that Emmett Till is one of the, the major catalysts in the, the push of the second wave of civil rights, along with perhaps Rosa Parks um, and, and, and with the rise of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, Emmett Till, this is global. This is not just the United States. The world sees this. The world sees this image of Emmett Till. And this was in Jet Magazine, uh, a, a popular African-American Print. So I think there's certain instances in history prior to 1955, specifically black newspapers, Chicago Defender, Pittsburgh Courier newspaper, um, that campaigned against lynching. Um, but they didn't necessarily use the images to, to do that. They, they, they wrote these things out. They, they wanted you to support the anti-lynching bills that were, that were going through at the time. But we really don't see uh, something of this nature until Emmett Till. Um, again, people can purchase Jet Magazine and they can see what's going on and read about it. So I, I wanted to conclude with that because um, one, this is a pivotal point in, in American history uh, when we talk about violence towards black people or people of color, but also this is a commodity that was used to educate. 
Not and so mass much, produce. And mass, mass produce one. to educate, not so much celebrate the death of it. I'm really glad you bring you bring him in and his his story in. Um, the reminder that he was 14 years old. Um, uh, the reminder of what was done to his body. Um, you know, kind of thrown in the water. He looks like that for a reason. Um, he had a he had a, I think it was an, an, a car engine tied to his neck, and they threw him in the water after they finished with him. Uh, I'm not sure. If he was alive or dead yeah. at that time. Bashed his head, shot he was shot in the head, beat up. I mean it's it's graphic. You can, as you can right. see. As you can see. It's it's always disturbing. The and the point of this isn't to disturb as much as uh, uh, the project that's in the gallery, which I do hope you go see, which I hope the images don't stop you from seeing it. They don't look like this, right? So yeah. definitely check it out if you want. Um, but the project that's in the gallery, like we had all this death, you know. Um, the project that was in the gal that's in the gallery, um, for, for me, this history is very is very much tied to it. I can't divorce this from from these contemporary happenings. Uh, you you don't have to strip. You don't have to go. I mean, your phone. You have to go to TV. Go to your phone. Look at the next hashtag that comes up. Um, and there are all kinds of interesting things going on in your world right now that are very connected to this history. They're not disconnected at all. And it's not a something for black people only to understand. It's not something for white people only to understand. It really is something, it's our story. It's part of our history. And, um, and the, goal, the goal of the exhibit uh, and, and, and these talks is to give just a, a little bit more perspective on a very, very, very rich and intense American history that often gets uh, glossed over or, or, or not dealt with uh, because it's a hard history to deal with. And um, I, I'm really excited about the fact that, that uh, the art gallery, Westfield State in general, you all are here, your professors. Um, some of you are here on your own volition, thank you. Um, but I'm happy that, that you're a part of what I believe is a, a new wave of critical thinkers who are willing to address tough stuff. That's what this is. Hard for me to make those images. Even harder for me to see them all collected together. Um, working on the images in my studio space was, that was hard. Technically it was hard. It's like, oh man, what did I do with this India ink? Oh man, the charcoal's not freezing to the canvas. It was a technical problem. Who are the artists in the room? All right, you understand, right? So, but when I saw them up, I'm like, oh my gosh. And the emotions came out. Because, um, this is something that's bigger than me. It's 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 our history. So with that, I uh, we only have a, a a little bit of time left, and um, I I'm, if I was wondering if there was anyone that had any consideration or any question or anything at all, and I'm more than happy to. Is is that show? Do I see? Who is yes, that? Yes, yes, that's me. Hello, Shofa. Um, no, this is for the benefit uh, of the students here. I'm a professor of ethnic and gender studies. Happy here. All right, I'm a professor of ethnic and gender studies, and my name is Shobha Rajkupa. Um, well, uh, Professor Ime and uh, uh, Professor Thompson, there's one thing that I want to include here. My doctorate was in media studies, as you well know. So I uh, would like to mention here that one of the foremost figures in American journalism history who exposed the horrors of lynching to the outside world and dedicated her life and had to flee the South was in fact an early American uh, suffragette and uh, abolitionist, uh, Ida B. Wells. Ida B. Wells. Thank Ida B. Wells. Thank you. Ida B. Wells, and there, there, there's only so much you can cover in this kind of, you're absolutely right. Ida B. Wells became one of the champions. And I believe she wrote several volumes, not just, I have one or two of her volumes. She wrote extensively, not just about you know, black liberation, this was about, you all don't understand what's going on. Like, you all need to know. She's reporting on the lynchings as she learns of them, as she witnesses them. Thank you so much for bringing that up. And, it's, and you're dealing, it, it, it's, it's a tremendous, it's a tremendous, um, it's a tremendous contribution that she ends up making uh, to this history, which still somehow manages to go relatively unknown, even with all of her great work. Thank you, Shoba. I saw another hand over here. Uh, yes. Ah, Joe. Yeah. Is that you? So, uh, my, my question is like. Um, Speak up. My my question is 
basically like, yeah, this is, uh, I, I believe what makes it so wrong is that it's celebrated. You know what I mean? Like, amongst all the activities that have done, it's the, the notion of celebration was going on here. And what I was trying to, what I was wondering is, if they took the act of celebration out and had the, the lynching ceremony in a more respectful tone, and then still allow photography, would it make the postcard any better? Or is it like still just as bad as it is because of the social Interesting. I don't know how to answer that question. I think a lynching's a lynching. Yeah. And I think there's hundreds of lynchings that are not documented that might have been more intimate in, in the sense of several people and, and then the act is committed. Um, what, what we're calling celebration, it, it's what we're calling, when you have thousands of people as, as, as those who attended um, Jesse Washington's, Washington's, I mean thousands of people um, who attended, so many people, a lot of people had to carry their children, their children, on their shoulders, right? Um, that does come off as a celebration because when we see thousands of people, we think Super Bowl, we think carnival, we think something, a baseball game, right? But that many people were rejected. They wanted to see this guy dead. Um, by the way, he was 19 years old and mentally challenged. Um, and uh, it took 12 minutes to convict him. They just, you know, he Not said, jury. right. It was just kind of like, oh, they're, and, and he's mentally challenged. Who knows what they said to him to get him to say whatever he said. They found something they believed was a weapon. They're like, aha, boom. And it was a big crowd. That does come off as celebratory. But I think it's, I think it's, it's really, uh, you'd have to go to the core of once again, finding, finding one person that represents everything, everything that you have angst about in that moment. And it's an entire society. Think, I don't, I don't know if you all have read Lord of the Flies. It's the, the idea that you know, when you get a group, groups of people together, you know, and the ones who are the voiceless, if they have a tendency to look like they're on the rise in any way, find one so that everybody else knows. I think I said this. Uh, I think I said this uh, uh, to you yesterday. We didn't do much planning of this because how do you plan a conversation? But I, I said it's a. Uh, I have the cockroach thing. Yeah. The uh, when I was younger, and because we were trying to figure out, is this something that's innate? Is this in us, like from the time we're children, to just do this to other people? Is that what this is? Uh, when I was younger, I, I had a thing where I didn't like spiders or cockroaches, like many of you. Okay, but what I did was, if I saw one, I saw a spider, I would kill kill the spider. But I would leave, I would leave the spider there, partly because I didn't want to pick it up, but I would also leave the spider there because I wanted it to stand as a warning to any other spider around here. It, it turned into, don't laugh at me, I know you've done this too, all right? All right? But it turned into, the spider turned into an apotropaic symbol. It, it turned into the cross against the vampires. Like, that's, that dead spider that I killed will let all of the other spiders in the house know not to mess with me. So leave it there for a couple of, I, I just say my little sister, no, let it stay there for a couple of hours. But the idea, the idea, you get the idea. In, in, even in the humor, you get the idea. The idea that, that, that using one person like a Jesse Washington, which we could easily, Joe, call a celebration, right? He becomes, he becomes the head on the pole, the warning. It's like, this is what befalls you if you don't stand back. And what would actually follow a lot of these lynchings would be decrees. They would say, if we see another black person in here after sundown, we have things called sundown towns, right? If we catch you here after sundown, this is gonna happen to you. And farmers, white farmers, would run black people out of their region that way. Absolutely. So it, it's, so Joe, it's, I don't know if you would call it a celebration as much as there might be celebration, celebrating in it, right? But it has more to do with the statement that's made. You know, it's the spider on the floor. Um, that for Imam's youth, All right? Um, I, we're 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 gonna kind of wrap the. Oh, you have a question? Oh, well, I'm sorry. Oh, the, why are you sorry? Oh, well, I just wanted to ask. Like, I know there were lynching towards young men, but were there also lynchings towards children and women as well? Yeah. Yes. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Unfortunate. It, it, uh, I think we do have an image. Is he 14? Do we have that in here? Is he 14? Which one do you look for? Oh yeah, he, he was he was only 14, I believe. Yeah. And I don't know how old they are. Yeah, I mean these are young young people. 
Um, there's, we, there's various images you can find, women, children, young, young adults, absolutely, absolutely. Oh, I, w one last one. Yes, give me your name. Uh, Tala. Oh, you're in my class. Yeah. All right, go ahead. Uh, one thing I think is crazy is that, you know, the same type of thing that is happening or has happened here in America is happening like right now in China as we speak, like today, like this, it's this racism where in the, the left side of China, this used to be called East Turkestan, and there was a native Muslim population, and they took it over because they're oil rich and mineral rich. And now they're committing genocide. Well, even today, they're posting like pictures of like wow. literally the Chinese people like cannibalize these people and maim them in the street or kill children and to encourage. And they've actually moved to places like Turkey and all around the world. I don't know if you know about that, but you can research it. It's like, I think it's just crazy that even now, today, in our world and stuff like this still happens. It's not a black white thing. Yeah, it's, this like, is, it's a human condition. Uh, it's a human. Thank you so much for sharing, Tullin. And I'm gonna look that up. Yeah, look that up. I mean, it's not on the news. You will never see it on the news. Right. Well, it's definitely. Yeah. It's yeah. It's recognized as part of China. It's called New Province, Regime Jing Province, or something. But it's, it's recognized as part of the country of the UN. So if you don't talk about it, it's not going to be talked about. And you know, same thing with China about the but for massacre. Thank you, Tullin. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so I think what we're going to do now, I think we're approaching the 12 o'clock hour. Is that, does someone have the right time? Are we around 12 o'clock? So this is actually a good place to, to wrap up. Thank you so much for coming um, to this. I hope it was somewhat useful to you. I think, I hope it was helpful. I encourage you to go into the gallery and take a look at what I have there. If not now, um, certainly um, at some point in time, it closes, the show closes on February 27th. Chope, I see your hand. Yes. Uh, could you raise your hands, my class, please? And um, for all of you, you have to go there next before you leave. For the rest of the class, I would like you to go all in there. It's right there in the art gallery. You heard Shoba, go. <laughs> <laughs> all right, thank you so much. Thank you very much.